Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So today we will talk about spray combustion this is actually like a follow up to the droplet combustion that we did where we were basically cons considering only a single droplet at a time and at the time I pointed out that um, uh, it, it may or may not be exactly the way it happens in reality because um, in reality you may have a, a cloud of droplets that burn or um, uh, you, you may have all the droplets evaporate by the time they reach a gas phase flame. Um, and therefore you do not necessarily have a droplet combustion and so on. So there are lots of different possibilities and it also depends on whether the spray is dense or dilute and typically we think about a, a single droplet combustion mode uh, in a spray uh, in reality most of the droplet combustion happens only in sprays right. So spray is the more realistic situation that we need to think about and um, the single droplet combustion mode probably happens only in, the, in, in situations where you have dilute sprays and so on. So <coughs> let us now see if we can take, take the idea of uh, the single droplet combustion further and see when that happens in a spray. So basically we will now look at uh, spray combustion. The, there are a couple of ways by which you can think about spray combustion similar to um, the way we have been dealing with the gas phase flames. So in the case of gas phase flames we had on the one hand premix flames on the other hand we had the diffusion flames right. So we could think about a, 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 uh, these, these things as uh, 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 there are uh, we, we could still think about like analogies to uh, spray combustion similarly but however we have to think about in reality it is again a in between it is not it is neither premix nor diffusion. So what is really meant by a premix spray combustion or what is meant by a, a diffusion uh, flame kind of spray combustion. On the one hand you could now think about um, droplets that are now um, uh, laden in an oxidizing gaseous flow, gaseous, gaseous oxidizing flow. So if it is possible for us to mix liquid droplets of fuel in a gaseous oxidizing flow and of course the gaseous oxidizing flow could also have inert gases like for example if you are looking at a, uh, a gasoline air mixture or something like that. Right. So air has the oxidizing gaseous species as well as inert gaseous species and then you are now throwing in uh, uh, liquid droplets of gasoline and then let us suppose that you now have that flow up here uh, uh, flow in a tube and uh, then you now stabilize the flame in between or you could also think about more like a Bunsen burner where you have the approach flow is actually made of the, a, a mixture of liquid droplets in a gaseous oxidizing uh, flow. So that is, that is one, one configuration that you can think about. On the other hand let us suppose that you now just have an orifice in which through which you just issue a, a uh, liquid fuel and uh, because the orifice is so small or the pressure uh, injection pressure is high or a combination of both you now have a spray that is coming out. So what is basically coming out is essentially a liquid fuel spray and the oxygen has to get in the oxidizer in the, is in the ambience and it has to get entrained into this and as it gets entrained it mixes uh, vaporizes the liquid uh, and, and uh, burns the liquid fuel and so on. So that, that would be like a diffusion flame counterpart. In reality as I said you, you would have a combination of these two things it is neither uh, this nor that and of course you can think about like a partially premix flame that is established in a in what could be nominally a non premix injection of liquid fuel but you since you have like a standoff distance it allows for some mixing and so on. So many such possibilities exist in reality. So what we will first consider is a premix mixture uh, for, for the sake of simplicity. Mixture of uh, liquid fuel droplets and uh, uh, oxidizing gaseous oxidizing gaseous oxidizer uh, plus inert or diluent right. So as I said it could have uh, 
like a um, possibilities or let us say you have a tube and then you have now the uh, reactants and then you have a flame and then you have products or you could have a, uh, a burner in which you now send the reactants and then you have a flame uh, and then of course you have products downstream of the flame. So the, these are different possibilities. So in this case for example you now have, can talk about, talk about a, a, a cell and uh, what is really opposing it is the normal component of the flow right. So that is equivalent to saying you now have a, a reactant flow at the speed of SL uh, that is uh, uh, approaching a stationary flame or in a, in a flame fixed coordinate system. Uh, so in this case what we are basically talking about is let us suppose that in, in if you now look at this locally or uh, in this region what this basically amounts to is if you now have a flame right uh, what you are essentially saying is you now have a droplet that is approaching the uh, uh, flame along with oxidizing gas uh, with inert and then it, it begins to evaporate because it is now in the influence of the flame as far as the heating is concerned and uh, as the heating happens you now uh, sorry as the uh, evaporating happens it, it now the, the, the uh, fuel vapor is now evaporating out and then also flowing along with the uh, oxidizing gas and mixes and you now reach the, the, the flame and when this liquid droplet goes past it you now still have a liquid droplet with a flame behind with, uh, around it as an envelope flame and this now decreases further uh, into a smaller droplet and then flame and so on. So this is uh, typically the kind of uh, uh, picture that we are looking at in these situations all right. So if it is possible for us to now set up something like a Bunsen burner with liquid fuel droplets we should now expect the larger ones particularly and that is what I am just next going to talk about uh, the larger ones will actually get uh, you start burning as they flow, flow through the flame and then begin to uh, go as individual droplets that are burning like in single droplet combustion that we have seen but the smaller ones will now uh, have evaporated by the time they reach the flame therefore you would not have a single droplet combustion right. So the question that we have to ask is um, what is the limiting droplet size be below which uh, below which you will not have a single droplet combustion mode okay. So if this droplet is going to actually shrink to 0 size by the time it reaches the flame uh, that means it, it, it starting uh, size should have been small enough. If it is large then it keeps on shrinking but when it gets past it begins to burn in a single droplet mode right. So the question basically is uh, what is the limiting size beyond below which we, uh, the droplets do not burn in a single droplet mode. The answer to that question can be ans uh, done by a, a, a simple analysis. So the, 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 the thing that we look at is what is the residence time of the droplet uh, in the flame right. So the, the uh, so what we are basically saying is sufficiently sufficiently small droplets are completely vaporized vaporized in the preheat zone the preheat zone of the flame is the is where the heat conduction is happening so uh, the characteristic time the characteristic time of uh, traversing through the uh, preheat zone preheat zone uh, is uh, let us say tau d is LD which is like the flame thickness divided by SL and uh, that would be K divided by CP rho G divided by we should have actually LD is K divided by CP rho G SL then we also have another SL therefore you get a SL squared um, and then what we have to compare this time is 
with the droplet evaporation time how long does it take for the droplet to evaporate versus how long is it going to be within the preheat zone right so uh, the droplet vaporization time time is is uh, tau v is dl not square divided by 4k uh, that is essentially is talking about the radius uh, divided by the um, uh, in terms of surface area divided by the evaporation constant it is essentially coming from the d squared law and uh, so this is this is as if uh, this is d squared law for evaporation we are not basically saying that it is going to burn in a single droplet mode but we talked about when we did single droplets we also said that the same approach can hold good for evaporation so uh, then we use the the expression for the evaporation constant uh, that we had, that we had obtained to get natural logarithm 1 plus b where b is uh, in our case cp t infinity minus t b the boiling point divided by the latent heat of vaporization so uh, if you now say that these two times are comparable then we begin to get a diameter of the droplet below which you would not have a single droplet combustion that means you would not have anything that is burning and coming out of the flame right so uh, for tau uh, d approximately equal to tau v or the same order uh, dl not min squared equals 8 rho g by rho l k over cp divided by rho g sl the whole squared natural logarithm 1 plus b the reason why we write rho g sl together is this is actually the the mass burning rate or the burning mass burning mass flux okay um, so uh, now for, for typical values of things like uh, if you now assume approximately stoichiometric mixture um, for the fuel and air where the combustion happens and uh, then you now throw in like rho l over rho g is of the order of 1000 uh, and then uh, and, and so on so you do all these things um, then so this gives about 10 microns so dl minimum uh, DL, DL not that is the original droplet size the minimum original droplet size is of the order of 10 microns 10 micrometers for uh, typical values for other quantities right now we can also see the dependency here so for uh, rho g sl uh, squared of the all going as going as p to the n you know it is coming from how the uh, the burning velocity depends on the pressure and uh, we are looking at rho g sl the whole squared so we remember that and uh, uh, we, we, we say it is going as p to the n then uh, uh, then d d l not minimum squared goes as uh, p to the uh, 1 minus n right and this is purely coming so what this means is the pressure dependence purely comes from the preheat zone length okay and uh, we do not have to worry about the, uh, the dependence of uh, the evaporation time on the pressure so the, the evaporation time is not dependent on pressure it is only the preheat zone length that changes with pressure and therefore the residence time of the uh, droplet within the preheat zone is going to change like this right so that is mainly the effect uh, on uh, of pressure what we should actually look for and you now have these bunch of droplets here so we, we the picture that we drew is only for one droplet right but that is not that is not reality so this is assuming like a dilute spray essentially uh, and then talking about a single droplet combustion event in the case of droplets uh, of size larger than the d minimum right so question is what is the interaction effect okay so uh, the droplet interaction now assume assume for uh, for the, this purpose equal size 
of uh, droplets right um, then what you are essentially saying is let us suppose that uh, these droplets are uh, located uh, in space at a, at a particular time with, with, with some distance and uh, what we would like to think is the distances are about the same okay uh, for, for the sake of what we are doing not, not very difficult we are basically looking for something like an average inter droplet um, distance so uh, what we could then do is now draw spheres around these right and so on and uh, if you now say this is this this uh, the sphere around which uh, you uh, around the droplet that you have drawn is having a diameter that is equal to the that is approximately equal to the inter droplet distance okay and then if you now take that sphere uh, worth of mass of oxidizer neglecting the presence of the droplet okay uh, and then take the mass of the droplet you can now form a fuel R mixture based on that all right. Now we are there are voids here and those volumes of the oxidizer we are not considering so it kind of compensates between uh, taking this volume and uh, not taking that volume right. So approximately speaking um, the, the fuel R ratio the fuel R ratio is uh, F over A is approximately um, 1 over 6 pi dl cubed rho l it is essentially 4 over 3 pi rl cubed but rl uh, dl is rl divided by 2 sorry um, uh, rl is dl divided by 2 so if you now plug that in there you get the 1 over 6 uh, dg uh, cubed rho g so the, the, the dg that we are talking about is the inter droplet distance average okay so dg average inter droplet distance right so what does that mean um, this is like rho, um, rho L over rho G times uh, DL over DG the whole cubed so what this means is uh, of course if you are for uh, nearly stoichiometric mixture stoichiometric combustion for typical hydrocarbons let us say uh, typical liquid hydrocarbons your F over A should be around 0 0.05 all right uh, you, you can you can evaluate that for typical uh, so you look at the stoichiometric chemical reaction and uh, uh, that means it is balanced and then you can look at the mass ratios for that uh, if you now plug that in and uh, uh, rho L over rho G is about 10 to the 3 right um, then we can we can find that DG over DL is of the order of 25 right so 25 is like more than 10 so we can say that uh, the, the uh, inter droplet distance is about is, is quite, quite larger when compared to the droplet diameter itself so this this uh, doesn't mean too much interaction but if you now start thinking about the effective pressure okay so uh, at higher pressures uh, rho g increases okay because as pressure increases rho g increases um, so if rho l over rho g uh, so if, 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 if rho g increases rho l over rho g decreases if rho l over do, rho g uh, de, decreases then dl over dg, DG uh, will increase or dg will decrease effectively right so dg over dl then um, dl decreases for example in, in um, automobile engines if you now look at the typical kind of pressures you will find that uh, those pressures dg by dl would be as uh, lower like about 15 or something okay still still around greater than 10 but you are now hitting a limit where you have to consider the interactions. Um, what we should then start think about is we started looking at a premix mixture 
but uh, let us now look at a jet, jet uh, a spray jet and a spray jet flame. So this is now getting closer to reality. Um, so what is going on uh, here is uh, two things one as you now have a jet that is uh, coming out this is jet of liquid liquid fuel it is also beginning to entrain air and, uh, and, uh, and then of course we have ignited it and there is a flame the question is are we having individual droplets that are burning in this uh, flame or is it like an envelope of the all the droplets that is burning together that is essentially the question that we have to ask right. So the, the answer to that is of course the droplets are evaporating from the heat of the flames right. So the, the competition now is between how much is the entrainment right because you need the oxidizer for the flame to happen and so therefore you, you need to have the entrainment to happen. So how fast is the entrainment versus how fast is the evaporation. So the evaporation is going to give rise to the fuel the, the, the gaseous fuel the entrainment is going to bring in the great gaseous oxidizer and you need to have both of these for the combustion to happen right. So typically when you are now looking at uh, uh, entrainment the entrainment is happening from the sides and then it starts uh, penetrating to the core. So there is a there is a core of uh, liquid which does not see the uh, uh, ambient air significantly right for, for, for some distance beyond which the ambience uh, penetrates. So uh, you, you could now think about the, the inner droplets not ex exactly going through a single droplet combustion right whereas the outer droplets are going through this because there is access to air. So uh, effectively uh, fuel is sprayed and the air entrains, entrains right so droplet at the core droplets at the core uh, may, may have insufficient oxidizing ambience now so what you have to look at is the competition between entrainment and evaporation right so uh, if, if entrainment is uh, is fast and and or or okay it's a combination uh, vaporization slow right so entrainment is faster vaporization is slower then what do we expect air is now beginning to get available to most droplets and therefore most droplets can burn by themselves they are harder to evaporate therefore they are, they are going to be waiting for the flame to come near them okay oxidizer to come near them and the flame to happen near them. So this actually leads to uh, single droplet burning more, more towards single droplet or so or droplet burning singly or in groups. Now once you have a single droplet mode of combustion that is established then it is difficult for the flame, flame to coagulate and then have a outer, uh, uh, outer envelope flame because once you have the flame you do not have fuel penetrating outside of the flame. So the oxidizer has to come to this to, to the flame in order to consume the uh, fuel right. So once you have this mode of burning this persists. It is kind of like a, uh, a, a stable solution that, that, the, that the system approaches. On the other hand if uh, entrainment is, is slow right and or, or vaporization fast so this now leads to a flame that is actually enveloping a what is called like a spray sheet so now you can look at a spray you now have a cover around this 
and that is exactly where you expect the flame to happen. So this is envelope flame at the spray sheet. Now once you have a, a envelope flame then that is not going to let the oxidizer get in okay. So the droplets will now be waiting for the oxidizer but no oxidizer is coming because it is all getting consumed in this flame. So they just begin to get evaporated because of the heat from this flame and they will have to undergo continue to undergo combustion in the envelope flame. So once you have an envelope combustion mode it, it sets in and it persists. You, you, it, it is hard for it to transition into a, uh, uh, a, a droplet combustion mode right. So this persists. Now typical examples of these are for example if you are now looking at a situation where the vaporization is slow that means we have to look for materials that are less volatile okay. So a uh, typical example of this would be having solids for example you look at coal particles. Okay. So if you, if you now look at pulverized coal, uh, so coal or coal dust okay example uh, coal dust flame. Now the example of this would be uh, the second one where the evaporation is fast is uh, essentially oils, so oil flame right where, where, the, where, where the oil is typically quite volatile. And so uh, the oxidizer spreads the, the, the fuel, the gaseous fuel spreads out and meets the oxidizer even before it can enter entrain uh, significantly. So then, what we have to look for is how does uh, uh, how does this what what we call as a cloud combustion or a dense spray combustion happen? Okay. We define something called a group combustion number or we can you can call it a group group combustion index or number um, this would be called G and uh, this is defined as N capital N DL not divided by L where uh, N is uh, is the uh, total number of droplets um, uh, total number of droplets that can be now written as uh, I should say goes as nl cubed where n is the uh, number density that means number of droplets per unit volume and l is uh, uh, characteristic dimension. Right. So essentially what we are saying is if you now have a total number of droplets times uh, the diameter divided by the characteristic dimensions let us say for example if you are looking at a, a spray flame or a swirl flame where you, you are sending in the liquid in a swirl flow and so on you have like a burner diameter. So within this burner diameter or of the order of the burner diameter how many droplets can you space is essentially what is, in, what is indicative of the group, uh, uh, group combustion number. And uh, what it basically means is if you have a large G uh, it indicates a group uh, group combustion if you have a small G it indicates uh, uh, single droplet combustion group combustion and uh, small G. single droplet combustion now in reality you, you could have also things that are in between that means you have small clouds of droplets that are burning uh, with, with the flame enveloping it but many such clouds separately right uh, as opposed to when you say group combustion it is like all droplets that are there are having a single flame. So the, 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 there is a reality that is in between so it is like the, these are extreme cases right so what would uh, and then the other thing that you have to point out is this is purely a geometric parameter right 
So we are talking about uh, what is like the spacing between the droplets if you will. So G is uh, purely a geometric parameter. And it does not take into account uh, these these things like we are not looking at how well is the entrainment happening versus how, how well the vaporization is happening okay. So these two will we'll keep this in mind um, but, but before, um, before we proceed with taking into account those in a, in a spray jet flame uh, but what we will think about is is it possible for us to think about like a, a spherical cloud of uh, uh, droplets right what, what, what could happen if you now have a spherical cloud of droplets uh, as a function of G. So if you now start from a large G towards a small G uh, what happens um, to a spherical cloud of droplets. Now there are four possibilities uh, that, that, can, that can happen uh, with, uh, with, with a spherical cloud of so consider a spherical cloud of droplets right. So what, what we are basically saying is can we have uh, a large G situation where we are, we are looking at a um, group combustion and uh, what that means is you now have lots of droplets that are in the core and uh, they are non evaporating right. So if you now have like a, uh, uh, a, a slow vaporization situation okay. uh, then let us suppose that you now have a spherical uh, boundary imaginary boundary spherical imaginary spherical boundary uh, of uh, non evaporating non vaporizing uh, droplets and out of which you now have uh, let us say smaller ones which are evaporating droplets. So they are obviously much smaller I'm, and, and I am just representing them by a dot and you can now talk about this as the spray boundary. So in all the pictures that I am going to draw off for the four possibilities the broken broken line refers to what is called as a spray boundary okay. So there is another way of thinking about this it is you can look at like a spray that is coming out of the board right in a, in a cylindrical manner it does not have to be spherical but you can look at things happening in a circular manner as a cross section right. So it is like you now have a non evaporating core and a evaporating surrounding that forms the spray. So this is the, the, the broken uh, line basically means this jet uh, the spray boundary so this is a, a vaporizing droplets and uh, the broken line is the spray boundary and you now have the actual flame around this right. Now as you now increase your uh, sorry decrease your G as you now go in this direction of uh, decreasing G the other possibility is you do not have a core of any non vaporizing droplets that means this diameter basically shrinks to 0 you are now beginning to think about uh, uh, droplets that can vaporize faster but still not fast enough for flame to eat in okay. So you know you now have uh, uh, a, a, a single spray boundary without having to distinguish between uh, vaporizing and non vaporizing droplets because all of them are vaporizing so that is vaporizing droplets and then you have a flame around right. Now the next possibility is for the flame to move in okay into the spray so as I said the broken line is the uh, spray boundary. So the moment the flame moves into the spray boundary you now begin to have single droplets in the periphery single droplet burning in the periphery and then you have group combustion in the middle. 
So that gets us to a situation where uh, let us suppose that you now have this picture of vaporizing droplets in the middle and uh, still it is not the spray boundary you have to, uh, actually have the main flame now we have to distinguish between main flame and individual droplet flamelets for those that are burning outside this. So those are individual droplet burning right and this is what constitutes your, your spray boundary. And finally the flame now eats into each and every droplet there okay. So that means you now have a spray boundary in which all droplets are burning individually and so on right. So this is a limit of low G. and uh, uh, this is individual burning and this is this is now OG right. The question is what happens so this is as if, as if like you had these droplets kind of put together in isolation as if they were not part of a flow right and then we were beginning to play with the G. So if, it, if there is a high G then there is more group interaction when there is low G there is less group interaction you have more individual droplet burning and so on. But what happens in reality for something like a, a, a spray jet flame the answer is in a spray jet flame you now have a flow field with a variable G. So you start with something like a very dense spray that is just beginning to atomize and then spread out and then you now have more and more entrainment that allows for individual droplet burning further out. So it is like a variable G that starts with a high value and then keeps proceeding along a low value. So this is where uh, it is not just purely a geometric parameter that we can rely on we have to bring in the flow effects uh, therefore in a, in a spray jet flame uh, G is variable. Right. So you now get into a situation um, where let us suppose this is your center line and uh, let us say you had lip of the nozzle and which issues out the spray and uh, you can now think about like a, a potential core and uh, you now have near the near the center line you have bigger droplets but away from the center line let us say you have uh, smaller droplets because they are evaporating and now you have a the, the main flame or the internal group combustion flame right and uh, outside of which as you now keep going the, the G actually decreases and you now have lots of cloud drop cloud combustion going on right forming the spray boundary so this is like the or maybe keeping with the convention we should use broken line spray boundary and uh, this is multi droplet. combustion and uh, there is a overall turbulent flame brush that, that we will have that, that encompasses the entire flame and so that is that is essentially a turbulent flame brush we, we, uh, we, we might look at it when we do turbulent flames that is it is it, an envelope of all the fluctuations right so that is let us say that is the turbulent flame. 
flame brush. How do you formulate this pro this kind of problem? Right. So the way we have to do it is obviously to deal with, deal it in a, deal with it in a statistical manner. So we, we have to look at uh, how to do spray statistics. Spray statistics. Uh, what you do is you now have what's called the spray distribution function. Function f of uh, f of uh, r or l, which is the droplet diameter, uh, position x, velocity u, u vector, and time. Um, such that this is like a uh, a density distribution that means f of uh, r l u uh, x should say x plus u and t d r l d x vector d u vector. So this is basically a seven dimensional space in 3D. Right, so you have three components of velocity and three directions of uh, location, uh, and then the the, the uh, radius. So this quantity now, right, indicates the number of droplets of uh, uh, radius uh, between, uh, or let's say, in range R L to RL plus DRL um, velocity position in range uh, x to x plus dx that is within this bin and, uh, and velocity in range u to u plus du right at any time t it is time dependent all right so we have to now let it let this fluctuate in time so when we now use uh, the word rl um, so the, the the quantity rl we are implicitly assuming a spherical symmetry so zoomed there are ways in which we can relax this but we have to see when this is, this is relaxable. Um, so the, the you now typically small droplets for example if you are looking at things like 10 microns and so on 10 to 100 microns like say you look at that range for most typical fuels you have a significant surface tension effect that spheroidizes the droplet okay. So the sphericity is maintained uh, because of the surface tension therefore we have to actually look at what else is causing the droplet to be non-spherical um, as competing against the surface tension. So what typically uh, allows for the droplet to be non-spherical is when it now tries to flow you now have a shear that is happening at the uh, surface as well as a hydrodynamic instability because you now have high density and low density interface which becomes unstable and so on. These things are obviously proportional to the relative velocity between the two the, the droplet and the surroundings okay. So if the droplet were to be stationary you do not have these effects right. So therefore um, uh, the Weber number Weber number describes the effect of surface tension uh, relative to uh, to that of or the dynamic force on the droplet. So WE that is a symbol, symbol for Weber number is uh, 2 RL that is for the diameter gaseous density times modulus of uh, u vector minus v vector the whole square that is the 
a relative velocity between the velo between the um, droplet and the ambient gas divided by sigma which is the surface tension right. So u is the droplet velocity v is the gas velocity right now for uh, w e greater than or of greater than or equal to about 20 uh, droplets tend to deform and break up. So if you are looking at atomization situation you are looking forward to deformation of uh, liquid sheets into ligaments and ligaments to droplets so you are looking at a high Weber number situation okay but once you get to fairly small droplets the Weber number becomes small and then the surface tension takes over. So for um, a Weber number greater than 20 droplets tend to deform and uh, break up right. So given this um, we can now write what is called as a spray equation for F on how this is actually going to go. Spray equation is a dynamic equation for F. Or L dot f plus now a divergence with respect to x of uh, the droplet velocity carrying the f and a dynamic uh, sorry diver divergence with respect to u of the body force uh, all equal to a s where now we will now explain these terms R L dot is something that we are familiar with which is D R L over D T right. So this basically tells how this F is going to change because you are having a evaporation or burning that changes the R at a certain rate with respect to time and for example if a D squared law holds right we know that R L dot is uh, goes as 1 over RL right that is something that we have seen before. Um, G is as I said uh, um, is a force per unit mass whatever forces are acting that that uh, change the droplet uh, uh, the, the spray the distribution function and S is actually the most important thing and also the most difficult thing is essentially the source term. And uh, essentially you, not, you have to look at two, two uh, sets of quantities one is creation and destruction. So creation and destruction so it is essentially a net source term uh, of droplets right. Uh, so creation is like for example by atomization and uh, destruction is by coalescence and uh, uh, let us say impingement with the wall right so uh, wall collision etc. So it is kind of like what is called the population equation that, that keeps track of uh, the, the droplet population given by F and uh, what you are looking for is how do the droplets get created and destroyed as a source of this uh, that is getting dynamically uh, going in a, in a flow field. Now um, these are difficult to model and the, the, the uh, fidelity of this equation lies in actually how we model this and that is where all complexities remain.